Since feelings are uh, very much at the center of uh, Wish I Were Here, most obviously, of course, the feeling of boredom, um, but also the feelings of restlessness, loneliness, frustration, despair, uh, and dreami dreaminess that emerge in the mood reports that Mark um, mentioned that preface each chapter, I thought I'd begin my response with a description of a certain feeling, of that uncertain feeling, uh, as rendered by Kingsley Amos in his uh, 1955 comic novel of that name. So I'll just give you about a paragraph uh, from Kingsley Amos um, to set things up. So about halfway through our, our novel, uh, the first person narrator describes his futile efforts, quote, <clears throat> in defending myself, presumably against a certain feeling. Such defense was never easy because of its habit of confusing itself with the feeling. How to define this feeling? Depression, not a bad shot. Boredom, oh yes. A slight twinge too of uneasiness and inert generalized lust, yes indeed. <laughs> the center of it might be called boredom but not the same sort of boredom which was fond of attacking me in slack periods in the library. That sort of bemused, trance-like, or even vaguely pleasurable boredom, like the drowsiness it so often merges into. This, tonight, was restless. It had already stopped me from starting to read. It would shortly drive me to the window again, as if I expected someone to call, though I didn't and no one would. And it would, later on, make me want to go out to the pub at the same time informing me that it would not be worth it, that I shouldn't like it there, and it would at once want to start to come home. So that particular mood report comes from John Lewis, uh, the librarian in the small Welsh town whose marital boredom has impelled him into an adulterous relationship with the, the wife of a local grandee. John is not exactly waiting, uh, in the sense implied by Roland Barthes in A Lover's Discourse, where he describes a taunt waiting as, quote, the tumult of anxiety provoked by waiting for the loved being, subject to trivial delays, rendezvous, letters, telephone calls, return. Amos's uncertain feeling is closer to the stalled, self-canceling, self-consuming desires that Mark investigates in Wish I Were Here. Lewis doesn't so much yearn for the presence of his lover as he yearns for the presence of his own self. Mark's book changes the way I read the passage that I just read to you. I now notice how the narrator tries to escape his boredom through various interstitial thres thresholds or interfaces, such as they were in 1955. Staring out the window, uh, escaping into a book, escaping into drink. Alcohol was, of course, uh, Amos's habitual antidote for boredom. And in his introduction to Amos's book, Everyday Drinking, Christopher Hitchens defends the practice precisely on the grounds that alcohol, quote, makes other people less boring. <laughs> <laughs> of course, if the above scene were rendered by a contemporary chronicle, chronicler of our existential despair, a Sally Rooney or a Kristen, Kristen Rupinian, there would be no thought of reading or staring out the window or going out to the pub. Instead, the bored subject would pick up her phone and start scrolling. Wish I Were Here is very much interested in the dyadic structure of boredom, the question of whether boring things exist in the world independently from our bored and boring selves, um, as well as the relationship between boredom and addiction. But Wish I Were Here is about a specific and very contemporary species of boredom, one tied to the neoliberal attention economy that structures our shared understanding of work and leisure, and reproduced by what Mark calls the interface. As he's, as he's said here today, which is not one platform or medium, but rather, quote, the complex and often invisible set of relations that conjoins individuality, longing, technology, and structural interests. Others have written about particular facets of that interface, the arguments for why you should delete your social media accounts now, um, and philosophers from Schopenhauer and Kierkegaard and Heidegger have explored the ways that boredom may be instructive of our shared existential condition or serve even as the well, wellsprings of philosophy itself. Mark's achievement here is not only to synthesize those two discourses, 
but to reveal the ways in which they are now inextricably and mu mutually constituted. Wish I Were Here certainly persuaded me that to consider the enervating effects of the interface in the absence of deeper understandings of boredom is to profoundly miss the point. Amos's narrator bemoaned the fact that our psychological defenses against boredom are easily confused with the feelings of boredom itself. And Mark's book attempts, in a much more ambitious way, to separate the symptoms from the underlying social affliction. While Mark recognizes the, the timelessness and the, the universal uh, structure of, or experience of boredom, how our, our internal experience of being bored in the airport lounge at Pearson is not appreciably different from Heidegger's experience of dead time at a train station. The provocative claim of the book is that our own boredom represents a political crisis. As Mark puts it, quote, boredom is now a natural extension of the unease and restlessness generated in the economic sphere, everywhere ex ex exaggerated by upgrade imperatives, frenzied claims concerning speed and satisfaction, and perhaps worse, a constant generation of happiness-destroying envy for a form of existence that seems always to be elsewhere, enjoyed by someone else. The claim is not that um, wallowing in the interface is itself boring, just that it's happiness-killing and addictive, um, but that a specific and contingent economic apparatus has posited a mechanism that has been engineered for the arousal of, of, of desire as a means of satisfying that desire. But as Mark observes and as our own experiences attest, the feed never stops. There is no bottom of the scroll. From the perspective of the interface, swiping is an end in itself. As I was reading Mark's book, um, I was, along with a few others in the city, watching the Raptors playoff run. And I was struck by um, an advertisement. Maybe some of you saw it, too. It was sort of on endless loop throughout the, the playoffs. Um, and the advertisement <coughs> that I have in mind features a, a, a bored couple on a couch. Um, and they're scrolling through their social media feeds. Uh, and they decide to go on a spontaneous camping trip. One says to the other, why don't, why don't we go camping? Um, and um, then the, the scene immediately changes. Um, and the couple are now sitting in their camp chairs in a forest. Um, and they're continuing to scroll through their <laughs> social media feeds uh, aimlessly. And obviously, the, the symmetry between the two scenes, the couch and the, the forest, uh, is intended to be comic. Why has this bored couple retreated into this bucolic sanctuary only to continue doing exactly what they were doing at home? But the explicit point of the advertisement is that this particular telecom company really does have the best cell phone coverage in the forest. <laughs> um, and who wouldn't want to continue to have access to Twitter and Instagram in, when you're stuck in boring nature? <laughs> the advertisement encourages us to dispense with the sentimental chestnut that traditional, traditional leisure activities like camping might offer respite from the boredom endem endemic to late capitalist consumer culture while encouraging us to identify in a fairly straightforward and unironic fashion with the addict, with the screen-addled people in the woods. Mark's intervention allows us to recognize the ways in which boredom has now become an essential part of the product. Right? We, we identify with the boredom, we, we recognize it as our default condition, and we recognize it as part of the thing that, that is being sold to us. Wish I Were Here applies its philosophical pressure on precisely these questions. First, what is a culture abandoned when it uncritically accepts the interface as the necessary and only antidote to natural boredom, boredom which can and should be avoided? And second, which particular economic agents within the current neoliberal, neoliberal attention economy serve to gain the most by allowing that assumption to go unquestioned? Mark draws elegantly from Schopenhauer and Heidegger uh, and Adorno to clarify the stakes of our cultural flight from boredom. Boredom is difficult. It is a torture. But to eliminate boredom is to foreclose the possibilities of imagining the world as it might be, to foreclose the possibility of philosophy itself. And I'm sure Marcus thought about the mysterious etymological accident that links the word boring, or boring with uh, 
boring experiences with our intellectual capacity to bore in, to drill into the substrate of consciousness and reflect on the meaning of our own condition. Um, Marx's political critique of neoliberal boredom uh, prompted me to wonder a little bit about the rise of the professions uh, in our technocratic society and, and specifically how the professions have weaponized boredom as a strategy for maintaining their own monopolies on particular kinds of knowledge. Uh, for decades, legal advocates have been campaigning for lucid, non-technical, reader-oriented language in all manner of legal writing. Uh, there's one legal network called Clarity, for, for example, uh, whose members include judges, lawyers, government officials, NGO people, scholars, um, who, quote, advocate locally for the use of plain legal language in place of legalese. Now, while Clarity and, and similar organizations are certainly correct to insist that uh, legal language is too technical to be understood by non-professionals, the non-professionals' experience of reading legalese and other forms of professional jargon for an extended period of time is not so much bafflement, but a kind of unendurable boredom. Th this is the boredom that prevents us from actually reading the user agreements and privacy statements that supposedly signal our informed consent with surveillance capitalism. After all, we all click the same box at the end anyway. There is no authentic choice to be earned by spending that hour bored out of our minds. On a broader social scale, this scenario, scenario highlights the, the ironic relationship between neoliberal citizens and our laws. Of course we don't actually read the things we're consenting to. Everybody proceeds on the assumption that this quasi-legal exercise is just a joke anyway. This is just one quotidian example of the, the, ubiquitous, the ubiquitous scrim of boredom that separates citizens from the levers of power in a technocratic society. Boredom, as Mark writes in the final chapter of Wish I Were Here, is experienced as an affliction. We most often seek to flee or destroy it. Our efforts are doomed to fail. Worse, they entangle us in economies of desire and attention that may prove actively harmful to selfhood and happiness. The question is not whether we'll be bored, but what we'll do with the boredom that afflicts us all. Wish I Were Here urges readers not only to reframe our own subjective experiences with boredom, but to understand the ways in which our current political and economic imperatives serve to reproduce boredom as a perpetual emergency from which to escape. The only part of this timely book that didn't ring true for me was Mark's final mood report. Heading into that chapter, the writer certainly may have felt gnostic, ironic, reflective, and dreamy. But to read Kingwell's fi final chapter is to experience a voice that feels passionate, outraged, sincere, energetic, and alive.